You're listening to the Nutrition Experts Podcast, featuring guests who take the scientific talk about food and break it down for practical use. You've heard the phrase, you are what you eat. Come find out what that really means. Experience conversations with experts in the field of nutrition and understand the power of food for our health, well-being, and beyond. Now, here's your host, registered dietitian and nutritionist, Mathia Ford. Hi there, it's Mathia. Welcome back to the Nutrition Experts Podcast, the podcast featuring nutrition experts who are leading the way using food starts today, right now, with our next guest. It's great to have Christine Palumbo on the show today. Christine, welcome to Nutrition Experts. I'm excited to have you on the show and share your expertise with my tribe. Hi, Mathia, and I'm just as excited to be here with you, so thanks. It was Exciting to listen to your presentation at the Oklahoma Dietetics Association meeting last month. And I wanted to talk to you some more because I thought it was a very interesting topic. So the topic we're going to talk today a little bit more about is generational trends, food differences, that type of stuff. So what made you interested in that topic? You know, I have always been interested in learning about what makes people tick. Um, I noticed that you have a master's degree in business administration, as I do, which is a rarity among registered dietitian nutritionists. And I remember for one of the classes being in a library and there was a whole, I remember seeing a a publication about psychographics and it was not just looking at demographics of, of people, but other types of people are interested in and that drives their behavior. So I've always been fascinated with that. I'm also very interested in the younger generations. I'm a boomer. I've got a sister who is, believe it or not, in Gen X. And I have three children who are millennials. And of the millennial children, two of them are married and have kids. One was recently married, no kids yet. So I've always watched with great interest how they eat, their attitudes towards nutrition. Uh, I like to see how they grocery shop, how they cook, and especially (laughs) because the millennials are very, uh, very much interested in eating out, you know, how often they eat out. Fascinating. So can you tell me um, or talk a little bit about the biggest concerns that the different generations have when it comes to nutrition. So kind of go through each generation and maybe a few of their concerns related to nutrition. Absolutely. So first, I'm going to start with the silent generation. These are people who were born between 1930 and 1945. So they are older folks. They are very interested in healthy aging, and they are also interested in brain health, preventing dementia. Many of the silent generation members are in excellent health. They're the subscribers to the newsletters, such as Environmental Nutrition or uh, Tufts University Health Letter, and finally, Nutrition Action, which is published by CSPI. Um, And then again, uh, there are people of the silent generation who are in poor health and those who have also passed away. So those who are still in good health, they want to stay healthy as long as possible, and they want to keep their wits about them. They want to stay, uh, keep their keep their brain health healthy. So that's the silent generation. And then we move into the next generation, the baby boomers. So those are people who were born between 1946 and 1964. And along with the silent generation, the boomers want to keep healthy brains, keep uh, keep their memory, keep their alertness, especially for those who are still working. They want to stay healthy for their grandchildren, if they have any, or those who are about to be born. And they also want to engage in anti-aging. They, a lot of boomers, don't feel like, well, they feel like they're the exception. (laughs) They think that they can prevent aging. They also think that they can cheat death, uh, which is is impossible. You know, as as the pastor of my church um, says every so often during his his sermons, he says, none of us are going to get out of 
get out of this alive. That's that group. And then we move into Generation X. It's um, it's a it's a smallest group, smallest uh, generation, and those members of that group are born from between 1965 and about 1980. And just a little aside, the only group for which there is a formal definition by the um, U.S. Census Bureau is the baby boomers. Gen Xers and everybody who comes before, or, excuse me, comes after them, there's a little bit of squishiness when it comes to the dividing mark with their ages or their uh, years of birth. So Gen Xers are parents of college students. In some cases, they are parents of uh, grown children, but usually they're in college or high school and perhaps even still in middle school. Gen Xers as well as the millennials, which we'll talk about in a moment, Gen Xers are very interested in taking care of themselves so that they can take care of their kids. Uh, They are very busy with various types of sports, marching band, uh, and so forth. So they need to have the energy to keep up with their their youngsters, their kids. And they're also interested in their children's nutrition so that the kids can perform well in school, boost the test scores, get into good schools, and launch successful careers. They're also interested in their kids' nutrition for sports. So that's Gen X. So the millennials were born from approximately 1981 to about 1994, although I have seen to about 1997. So again, there is no formal definition, no agreed upon definition of uh, who the millennials are. Um, The way I like to look at it, it's, it's probably not uh, necessarily fair, but I think of the millennials as the children of the baby boomers. But that that's just Christine's definition. Um, <laughs> so this is this is the largest generation. The millennials have eclipsed the baby boomers as the largest generation in this country. And they, again, they're starting to, they have kids at home. Um, Some of them haven't yet formed households, but they are uh, very seriously uh, in the market, if you will, for forming households and settling down and having children. And then Generation Z, so another term for uh, Generation Z would be the post-millennials or even the iGen, they were born from approximately 1995 or again, maybe 1998 to about 2012. So I think of these people as today's current college students, say the 18 to 22-year-olds, um, high school students, and then younger than that. And they are, gosh, they're just all over the place in terms of having the money to spend, knowing how to cook, being interested in nutrition. This last generation is the most ethnically diverse. And so that influences their enjoyment of and interest in a variety of foods, spicy things, foods from different countries. They've even shaken up uh, what we oftentimes call fast food, you know, or uh, what the industry likes to call quick service restaurants. They're not going to the traditional, typical quick service restaurants like Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's, but they're expanding to places like Chipotle. It's an interesting group to watch. There's definitely some overlap in the interests and food and and eating habits of millennials compared to Gen X, but there are some dis- uh, distinctions. So I'm a Gen Xer, and my kids are the I generation, and <laughs> and I've noticed, or Gen Z, whatever you want to call it, um, I've noticed that they're very in tune to environmental concerns. So they hear of things on TV or whatever, and they want to know why, you know, things are happening and they seem to get a little bit more of the news and that may just be my family, but they seem to be concerned about waste, about throwing things away. They want to make sure we're recycling. So I don't know, is that any sort of trends or? Well, you know, I don't have any data to back this up, but my hunch 
is due to my own personal experience. And I think it's the age at which they are, Medea. Because I recall that when my millennial children were in middle school in particular, they were very interested in the environment, very interested in recycling and all the things that you're talking about. And in fact, the recycling craze uh, really took off when the millennials were in school, were in elementary school, when they were in middle school. And um, so I think it's I think it's just something that it's part of the life cycle. I think it's just an interest that they have. So what I recall from the time is that the millennials got their parents to recycle. They came home from school and they said to their baby boomer parents, We need to be doing this, and that's when the recycling boom really happened. Now, what's happening now that's new and has happened over the last maybe five years is the extremely important issue of minimizing food waste, and that, to me, is a new horizon. I think that there's a lot out there. If you look at articles about food waste, restaurants are doing their best to minimize it. I know in my own suburban Chicago home for years, my husband and I have a little system where we he put out some containers and every bit of food waste that I can put in a, these compost containers, I do. Even coffee grounds that are in paper filters, those go out there and they all decompose. And in fact, just this past weekend, my husband went to one of the containers and dug out the beautiful black crumbly compost and put it on top of our garden squares in preparation for planting our tomatoes and our herbs uh, this, this coming weekend. I used to travel a lot and they used to change the sheets on the hotel beds every night and never encourage you to hang up your towels. It was always just they'd get you fresh towels every day. And now when I go to a hotel, I notice, okay, we're not going to change the sheets except for, you know, unless it's your third night or something. And they're constantly encouraging you to improve the environment. So yeah, reducing waste. Can you talk about specifically a little bit with the baby boomers? Because I think, yes, Younger generations have some healthcare concerns at times, but as the baby boomers age, as they become Medicare eligible, what effect are they having on on healthcare and how we deliver and how we give them healthcare as they get older? Baby boomers are currently aged 54 to 72. And that is a very wide range in terms of where they are in their uh, life stage and in their health. So they actually have, the demographers have actually broken this down to two cohorts, an older group ages um, 63 to 72 and the younger group ages 54 to 62. So the 63 to 72, most of those are eligible for Medicare. Some of them are um, drawing Social Security, and whereas the younger ones, they're not. Uh, The baby boomers, as I mentioned earlier, they are interested in anti-aging. So one example, and I mentioned this, I believe, when I spoke in Oklahoma last month, in the state of Florida, there are clinics that are popping up where they offer blood transfusions drawn from millennials at up to $300,000. And and so the baby boomers are spending, they're spending their children's inheritances to get transfusions from young people. That's an extreme. Another area where the men are involved is they're taking testosterone in order to look and feel younger. Unfortunately, these men are serving as guinea pigs because there is not much research on the safety, especially the long-term safety of taking testosterone. Um, another area where baby boomers are uh, have changed things is in the area of weight management. And of course, you and I and most of our listeners are well acquainted with the overwhelming 
evidence or preponderance of overweight and obesity in this country. You know, I think most of us know that two in three Americans are considered overweight uh, based on their body mass index, and one out of three is considered obese. So what the baby boomers are doing in terms of weight management, it's it's not so much how they look, although that is there is some aspect to that, but they're using weight management, weight loss as a pragmatic tool to prevent illness. And it's actually a physical emblem of good health. So in other words, they, they want to slim down so that they look healthy. And there are so many boomers who are single for a variety of reasons, and they want to look attractive for the opposite opposite gender. So um, that's one thing. And then something about baby boomers having to do with food, when they were younger, in their 20s and 30s, they were at the leading edge of many contemporary food and beverage trends. Um, So these include fresh and less processed foods and beverages. Uh, baby boomers, because they have, many of them have time, if they are retired or semi-retired, they go out to eat a lot. Even if they're not retired, a lot of boomers who are empty nesters, in other words, their kids have uh, left home, and they, so they have time and they have money to go out to eat. So they eat out a lot. And in many cases, I've, I've noticed just anecdotally, just from people that I know with this generation, the women were the primary meal procurers. They did the meal planning, grocery shopping, cooking and cleanup. And guess what? They are done. They are so done with cooking. And so they want to go out to eat. And I think the husbands gladly go along. So they're eating out a lot. They go to a variety of restaurants. In some cases, they take their kids out or even their grandkids if applicable to either a quick service restaurant or a fast casual like a Panera. So they eat out a lot. And uh, you're a dietitian. I'm a dietitian. We both know that eating out at restaurants of any type is associated with more calories taken in for most of us and therefore some weight gain. So there is a bit of a conundrum there uh, often. T- and then uh, baby boomers, you know, the women have, they're either postmenopausal or uh, actually most of them are postmenopausal because the average age of menopause is 51. And if the youngest baby boomer is 54, then most of them are postmenopausal. So there is general weight gain and tummy tummy gain um, after menopause for women. But uh, with w- when they go out to eat, they're taking in more calories and they blame menopause or maybe they're take, blaming a medication for their weight gain. But maybe they should just eat at home a little bit more often or uh, order, um, uh, in, take in fewer, smaller portions when they eat out. Well, you know, I have had people tell me that, like you said, the empty nesters Sometimes, especially if you're single, it's almost easier and cheaper to eat out because you don't have the leftovers. You don't have to go to the grocery store. So and you don't have to fix, you know, maybe they were used to fixing bigger portions. So it's an interesting justification (laughs) for eating out. (laughs) But But, yeah, I, I think it's not so much a cost saving. I think the justification primarily is. I am sick of cooking. <laughs> yeah. Well, or if they're still working and, you know, their spouse may be still working. So, and they don't have all these other acts. It's also a social experience to eat. Food is a wonderful opportunity to just sit down and talk if you put your phone down, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. So, so you talked a little bit about how baby boomers kind of experience food differently or have had changed some trends. Can you talk a little bit about the other generations, how they uh, experience food or how they um, interact with food differently? Sure. Well, let's touch briefly on the silent generation. In contrast to their grandchildren and perhaps even great-grandchildren, they are accustomed to eating three square meals a day. There is very little snacking that takes place with the silent generation. It just wasn't part of the culture uh, when they were growing up and when they were younger. And I happen to think that's a good thing. 
I think I think that snacking has just gotten out of hand in this country, and I think that that has contributed to some of the waking that we've had. You know, we dietitians have said for years, oh, you should eat, you know, many small meals and don't allow yourself to get too hungry or don't don't allow your blood sugar to get too low. And people would hear the, uh, you know, multiple. Uh, if you if we said multiple small meals, I think they heard the word multiple and they didn't hear the part the small part. So, <laughs> so little snacking um, again. They are tired of cooking. They go out to eat a lot, and and as you mentioned, it's a social experience for them. They and again they take their they they like to go to places like McDonald's, and um, it's quick, it's inexpensive, it's predictable, and. They take their grandchildren there. Um, So that's uh, the silent generation. Now, millennials, they sure have done a lot in terms of their um, eating habits. They're very focused on healthy and convenient foods, but they also like to indulge their senses. So they expect healthy, convenient, and indulgent foods based on, well, the USDA Uh, The Amber Waves posts, they say that um, millennials spend more of their grocery money on prepared foods and also pasta, sugar, and sweets compared to other generations. What's really heartwarming as a parent of two daughters and a son, millennials who are married or have live-in partners, they share the shopping responsibility responsibility between the genders. So I say yay for that. And even parenting has changed where co-parenting is the norm and the dads are nearly just as likely to grocery shop as the moms do these days. And when they go to the grocery store, both the, the men and the women, they are really big on the use of technology. So they use apps and they use recipes that they access while they're shopping. So they might come across a you know, an item that's on sale or they just see something that strikes their mood. And rather than trying to, you know, uh, just passing that item up because they don't know what to do with it, they access recipes uh, via apps on their on their mobile devices, looking for um, recipes in that way they have all the ingredients. Uh, millennials are big label readers, yay. They are bigger um, label readers than the general population. And in fact, about 65% look on the product label, and that's greater than other generations. What millennials are big on, though, Amathea, is the brand story behind the food product, the brand story. So they're looking for the origin, the certification, and the authenticity. I was at a grocery store last week in my town, and it's just a, it's Jewel, and I believe they are part of Albertsons. It's a store that has been in Chicago, the Chicago area for dozens and dozens of years. It's, it's just a staple. And I was picking out some pears, Bartlett pears, and there was a sign attached to the pear display with the picture of a farmer. A female farmer, uh, pretty. She had a hat on, you know, like a, kind of a uh, cowboy hat, and it talked about the farm and had her name. And it said, "These Bartlett pears are from this farmer and this farm." And it gave the location um, in, uh, you know, just outside of the Chicago area. And I was, I was kind of blown away by the store that had it, as well as the type of product. So that's that's something. So so uh, millennials really want to know what's in their food and where it came from, and that demand for information is growing, and it's comforting to millennials as well as uh, Generation Z. You know, knowing a little bit about their food and the company that it comes from, or the farm or the farmer, it comforts them. And something else about millennials, which I find fascinating, is that they're making their food choices based on their value system. So it's a part of saying, you know, I want to feel healthy or I want to identify with the food that I eat. And that is a a shift from previous generations. So uh, more about millennials. They really like evolved flavor profiles. They are very interested in ethnic 
and evolved flavor combinations. It's actually become a cliche to assume that millennials love sriracha, the red hot sauce. And in fact, McDonald's introduced a sriracha burger last year. Uh, And sales of sriracha and hot sauces are way up. Millennials are into, uh, I think I'm not even sure how to pronounce this, poke, P-O-K-E, it's a raw fish salad from Hawaii. And shakshuka, which is a poached egg and tomato recipe from the Middle East. There are Pinterest boards dedicated to these foods and more, um, you know, fascinating to me. Um, And then one other thing, if we have time with the millennials, and that is they're looking for new ideas when it comes to cooking, and they're also time challenged. So as dietitians, we can help them by giving them advice. We could provide instructional videos on YouTube or on our on our websites or blogs. We can create listicles for them. And that's a combination of the word list and article. So of course, nobody wants to read a full article anymore. So everything is bulleted or <laughs> everything is a list. Community groups are, are big uh, in Pinterest, just huge resource for people who are looking for authentic recipes that millennials are drawn towards. Well, you know that, uh, and, and yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, that's very interesting with the recipes and the apps, because my husband and I do use an app when we go grocery shopping and you can mark it off and it keeps us all updated so we can split up in the grocery store and, and get everything. But with the um, videos and in that same app, you can look up recipes, you can watch a video um, and see how something is made or, and I've noticed that my kids who are the I gen love watching YouTube videos. Like that is their TV now. YouTube is the biggest social media platform. I believe it because my kids will watch, I mean, they, they have, favorites and they know these people's names it is really sad to me a couple like a year ago I was watching Jimmy Fallon when I was getting ready to go to bed and there were these two guys on there and people are somebody's gonna laugh at me because I don't remember their exact names but it was Reed and somebody and they're like science guys and they do all these tests but they were YouTubers and my daughter walks into the room and she's like, oh, Reed and such and such are on Jimmy Fallon. And I was like, I had no idea who these guys were. So, but they're, they're, um, it's that ability to kind of build their audience on YouTube, do that social network. But yeah, there's all kinds of recipes, all kinds of information on there that I think is just very easily consumed and they enjoy consuming that information in that way. I think you hit the nail on the head, very easily consumed. Yes. Yeah. Something that they can pick up and eat that's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been a dietitian for 21 years. I know you've been a dietitian for a little while too. So a lot of, lots of things have changed since we became dietitians. I, for one, remember first learning about food labels in my college classes and when they were getting ready to come out. So there was not even food labels on everything when I first became a dietitian. So can you tell me what's your favorite thing that's changed in nutrition thought that has happened kind of since you've become a dietitian over time from then to now? The first one, the first um, welcome change is the recognition that plant-based fats are actually helpful. I remember when I was in school and for my early years of my career where the advice was to eat a low-fat diet for health as well as for weight management. And now we realize that it is the quality of the fat, where the fat comes from, that makes a big difference. And that a low-fat diet isn't beneficial. In fact, it can be harmful. Uh, in one of my first jobs, I was a cardiology dietitian and I was teaching classes to the heart attack victims or uh, heart, people who had had heart attacks and their families and people who had had uh, cardiac surgery, uh, the coronary bypass surgery. And I would tell them they had to avoid nuts because nuts were high in fat. And then 
I would go home and I would eat nuts. And somehow, so I had to toe the party line, if you will, and say, eat low fat, avoid nuts because they're high in fat. But my instincts told me that nuts, nuts were healthy, that they were good. So that's one welcome change. And then the second one is related, and that is the recognition that a plant-based diet offers a wealth of health benefits and that we should try to fill our plates with plant foods and eat animal protein, such as meat, more of a condiment, more as a small, you know, a side dish, if you will. So both have to do with plants. I know, and and as a dietitian, I've been asked the question so many times, you know, what's the healthiest food or tell me what I should eat or how many, what percent of calories should I eat from uh, carbs, protein, fat, or, you know, just basically tell me what to eat. And I would, and now I, my, my advice is, Concentrate on whole, unprocessed foods, and most of your calories should come from those, and then you can augment with some other things, but plant foods. And that meat and animal proteins, you know, you can still eat them, but in smaller portions and even skip a day or two. How can RDs and other nutrition professionals or people who are interested in nutrition stay on top of trends and get information on trends? from a place that they can trust? Well, you know, a couple a couple of um, suggestions here. One is to basically keep your eyes and your ears open. What are your friends asking you about? When you go to the hair salon or nail salon, what are you overhearing? What types of conversations are you overhearing? So that would be my first tip is just stay alert and be aware of what people are asking you. Another is when you're getting ready for work in the morning, and maybe you have a news program on, the Today Show, Good Morning America, uh, CBS This Morning, or some of the other uh, programs. What are some of the topics that they're covering? Are they bringing out questions about, or are they bringing out topics such as uh, a new diet fad, or what is the latest super fruit or super food. And I use those terms in quotation marks because in my book, and I think in a lot of people's books, any food that grows from the ground is a super food. <laughs> um, so, you know, be, be aware of, you know, what you hear in the um, broadcast media. Also, maybe you're listening to radio. Um, you might hear some uh, information there. Um, scan headlines of some of the major newspapers and magazines. So New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, Time Magazine, every once in a while. Actually, quite often there are articles pertaining to to that. When I was preparing for this discussion, I saw an article that had been published in the Washington Post, and it said that the coconut oil craze was over. And my first reaction was, huh, I didn't know that. <laughs> because co coconut oil, coconut fat, and all things coconut has been huge over the last few years. But apparently a couple of years ago, that fad has more or less passed away and we're on to other things. And I didn't know that. So that was interesting. And then um, there are for uh, dietitians and people who are involved in the food industry, there are all sorts of free uh, electronic newsletters that you can subscribe to. So GMA Smart Brief, foodnavigator.com, the International Food Information Council has an annual, it's either annual or biannual survey of consumers, and it's a wealth of information. Um, there, For people who are interested in the grocery industry, there is a website called Food Dive. Uh, and then finally, Supermarket Guru, uh, that's Phil Lumpert. And he has um, interesting pieces every so often. So all these provide free <laughs> the magic word, free newsletters that can appear in your inbox uh, daily. And I know sometimes when I just get busy, it's like, oh, I can't deal with this all. So I just delete them. So I, I don't even worry about it. I'm missing something. Yeah, because it's going to pop up multiple places and start being things that you hear over and over and then go and look a little more. Very good point. Very good point. Yes. Well, Christine, 
I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It was a pleasure to have you on our show. I know my listeners have learned a lot about differences in generations and kind of what changes and what stays the same over time. So if listeners want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Well, thank you for inviting me, Mathia. It's been fun um, talking about one of my favorite topics. And yeah, sure. If anybody would like to follow me, I'm on pretty much all sorts of social media and you can connect with my social media via my website. So my website is christinepalumbo.com. Um, and I will spell that because um, it sounds a little bit different over the air. Uh, Christine is spelled with a C. Uh, so it's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E. P is in Peter. A-L-U. M is in Mary. B is in boy. O dot com. So on my website, I, ha- I put media articles in where I am quoted. And again, my social media, Twitter, my Facebook page, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I have all of those concentrated on the homepage of my website. And at some point this year, I will likely put together a newsletter. I just haven't had the chance to formalize that, but that that is on its way. So that way you don't even have to go and look for my information. Great. Well, guys, this has been another great episode of the Nutrition Experts podcast, the podcast that is all about learning more so you can do more with nutrition in your life. You've just listened to an episode of the Nutrition Experts podcast. Be sure to get more information about this week's episode at www.nutritionexpertspodcast.com. Tune in next time for another great conversation with a nutrition expert and expand your personal knowledge in the field of nutrition, one conversation at a time.